Well, 13 years ago, Britain and China put pen to paper, sealing the fate of Britain's biggest jewel in its colonial empire. Like it or not, Hong Kong was going back to China, but in what political form? That fueled the talks leading to the signing of the Joint Declaration, putting Hong Kong in uncharted waters, with Deng Xiaoping's formula of one country, two systems set for the territory after 1997. Well, tonight we talk to one of the major figures who helped plot this course in our special series, Hong Kong Back and Beyond. We chat with former British Foreign Secretary Lord Howe about his personal views on Hong Kong's future and how it was mapped. He was then known as Sir Geoffrey Howe and was Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's right-hand man when he took up the top job at the Foreign Office in 1983, a crucial time in the negotiations which were entering into a new phase. Uncertainty hung over Hong Kong and on April 20th of 1984, the Foreign Secretary had an unenviable task. But it's right for me to tell you now that it would not be realistic to think of an agreement that provides for continued British administration in Hong Kong after 1997. Four months after that announcement, the mild-mannered Howe succeeded in convincing China to agree to something it resisted. That's making terms in the joint declaration legally binding and having the joint liaison group operate after the handover. Howe served from 1983 to 1989, seeing Hong Kong through probably its most uncertain time in its history. How difficult was it to get the Chinese to understand that British administration should continue beyond 1997? Well, it was our opening bid, as you remember. We wanted to try and achieve that. And had it been possible, it would have been a, a very, very reassuring thing. But clearly the Chinese were determined to restore the sovereignty, which after all, they were entitled to do, even under our own lease. So it was a good way of describing the kind of future we wanted. And in many ways, Deng Xiaoping responded by saying, you can't have that, but you can have one country, two systems, so that the system that the British and Hong Kong people have created together can continue. So that was an important halfway house, if you like. Did you have to use a special approach whenever you I think the, the, the important approach was to establish our good faith, uh, to establish in their mind an understanding that we respected China. See, China has thought of all the Hong Kong agreements as being unequal treaties imposed by Western invaders on this great Asian power. And I think I was very much at pains then, when I first met Wu Xiechen in, in, in Beijing, to get across to him that we were both countries with a great history, a great civilization. Do you think that Britain was preoccupied with the Falkland, Falklands War? So. Um there was not enough attention put on Hong Kong oh, at the no, time? Not, not in the least, no. The Falklands War, it's hard to remember now, was over in a flash. Uh, at the end of March, the Falklands were invaded, and by June, uh, they'd been liberated, and, and that was that. I mean, it's extraordinary to say so about the great episode. And the negotiations didn't really start until Margaret Thatcher saw Deng Xiaoping in September 82. Were there any divisions as far as the approach in dealing with China? The no, we, we, we always wanted to arrive at an agreed approach. And of course, people started with different ideas. We took account of the views of, of Hong Kong coming from Exco through the governor. We took account of different opinions in the British Parliament. But we always arrived at an agreed approach. What was the biggest challenge for you during the negotiations? I think the length of time it sometimes took to grapple with details which didn't seem to be important. Uh, the Chinese are very tough negotiators. We were, I, I think, tough as well. And uh, occasionally one got frustrated with the sheer grind of that. The most difficult thing of all, and in the end the most important thing, was the agreement on the joint liaison group. What your experiences with Deng Xiaoping were like? Was he um, quite gregarious throughout the whole process? Was he s quite optimistic? He, no, he was, he, he was a man, I say he was because I haven't seen him for a long time, none of us have seen him, but he was a man of great uh, wit and intelligence and skill. Uh, and I remember when we were talking, for example, about the, the first stages of the Joint Liaison Group, 
as to whether it should meet in London or in Hong Kong or Beijing or all three. And I said, well, it may be possible for us to compromise. And he reached out, shook me by the hand and said, right, we've done a deal. And I said, no, hang on, we haven't. But he was very keen to, take, to drive home his advantage. I was dealing, if you like, with a, a short male Chinese Thatcher. I, I, I dealt with Margaret Thatcher as a very tough leader myself and knew the need for tough leadership. I knew that I was talking to a, a determined leader then. What was going through your mind when you stood next to Deng Xiaoping and you watched uh, Mrs. Thatcher and Zhao Ziyang sign the agreement? Were you relieved? Yes, I was, I was enormously relieved and I was very conscious of being present at a moment in history and the, one of the great pleasures for me was to have the Hong Kong people surrounding us in, in Beijing at that time because I had lived through with them the days and weeks of very, very anxious negotiation. Um, so it was a great high moment in history. History has its peaks and its troughs and we have our worries and our moments of success. So that was a moment of achievement. But life goes on and there are going to be many difficulties and many achievements in the years ahead. And I think people who are now critical of it I tend to forget that we started with very few bits of straw from which to make our bricks. So China really came a long ways yes. in signing the Joint Declaration. V very much so, and, and it was acclaimed. Even my old sparring partner, my friend Dennis Healy, who was then shadowing me in the House of Commons, he paid glowing tribute to it, and that really did startle me. 